So there's over 100 bilateral and plurilateral intra and extra regional trade agreements that have been signed or are in process in this greater East Asia region. Uh, the most important of which, uh, so uh, ASEAN's own free trade agreement, but it's also signed ASEAN plus one agreements, so this is association of Southeast Asian nations, agreements with China and Japan and Korea. So that's in place, those are in place. Also being negotiated at the moment are, is a free trade agreement between China, Japan and South Korea, an ASEAN plus six <coughs> regional comprehensive economic partnership, so we don't have trade agreements anymore, we have partnerships. Uh, and that is scheduled to uh, be completed by the end of 2015. We have the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the TPP, with 12 members, including Canada, which is supposed to be uh, completed by the end of this year. And then we have a free trade area of Asia-Pacific, which the 21 APEC members are attempting to negotiate and which they say they will do so within a couple of decades. So I'm not going to worry about them anymore because they're taking too long. The others are um, in progress. Now, <clears throat> I just want to go to my three maps now just to show the differences between those various agreements. So this is ASEAN plus three. So the 10 ASEAN countries, uh, plus China, plus South Korea, plus Japan. And this is China's preferred view of the region and preferred uh, negotiating group. And I'll explain uh, the way it's doing that uh, in a bit. This is, the, uh, this is ASEAN's initiative, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Agreement, which is the, the 10 ASEAN countries plus China plus, plus South Korea plus Japan plus India, Australia and New Zealand. So that's another one that's under negotiation. And then finally, with map three, there's the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement uh, with the US and Canada, Mexico, Peru, Chile, uh, four of the ten ASEAN members are currently members of that. Australia, New Zealand and Japan has just joined in the talks too. Noticeably absent is China. So this uh, sets a question about well, what's going on here. So uh, we heard from Marty this morning a lot about um, the production chains and the integration of them uh, within East Asia and uh, the importance of the US market too. But these seem to be attempts that are more to do with dividing the region than, than integrating it in some sense with the US on one side and China on the other, which suggests that the sorts of issues that Matthias was talking about around geopolitics might be uh, uh, more important in that case. So. What I want to argue is that these, that those trade agreements which are uh, underway are part of uh, a refiguring of the geopolitics of China's rise. So countries, chi including China, are trying to figure out what its rise means for the region and what that region is, whether it's Asia or whether it's uh, Asia Pacific. And also in these different agreements there are various different approaches which are taken uh, to development too. So just let me start with uh, what China's been doing. So uh, China negotiated <coughs> the China-ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. And uh, ASEAN economically is not that important to, to China in terms of trade flows. Uh, but nevertheless, it invested considerable amount of resources, negotiating resources, in, uh, in that particular agreement. And uh, people who have analysed it have argued that it's, it was designed as a, a piece of economic diplomacy to reduce the China threat for its, to its neighbours. Um, so Chin and Stubbs have a, a good quotation where they 
uh, it's a quote from Chinese uh, negotiators, who say that the idea was that uh, of the China-ASEAN agreement was that both sides would benefit, but one gives six out of ten, the other gives four. Now, I suspect that Walden may argue who gave the six and who gave the, the, the four, but certainly from China's side, they argue that they gave uh, more than they received it because the purpose of the ne negotiations was, to, uh, was more diplomatic and political uh, rather than economic. And it was touted by China as an example of South-South cooperation. Uh, the Cross Straits Economic Partnership framework, which China also negotiated uh, recently with, with Taiwan, is also uh, very much part of that same, uh, same type of model. Now, China's agreements, trade agreements within the region, seem to be much more based about on uh, making sure that its neighbours do not fear China's rise, whereas if you look at the, the trade agreements that China has signed outside of the region, the normal economic interests seem to be uh, more dominant. So there, there's concern about you know, protecting agriculture, uh, protecting state-owned enterprises, um, tariff reductions on the basis of reciprocity that you find in China's extra-regional agreements, and so they tend to be a little bit different. So there's a case to be made, I think, that China's uh, arrangements within the region are a little bit different than those outside of the region, and that this um, trying to uh, minimize the China threat is part of this strategy. Uh, China, Japan, and Korea have launched free trade talks of their own, and they've had two rounds in 2013 with a, a third round uh, scheduled for later this year in Japan, but who knows uh, whether that will take place. Now, walnuts. We've heard a lot about coffee. It's about time we heard about the disadvantaged walnut here. <laughs> so I want a, a quote from, uh, which uh, Beeson and Lee use from a Chinese scholar, uh, Su Hao, about China's strategy, and they report that, and I quote, for Su, as for many other Chinese policymakers, ASEAN plus three, which excludes the US, but which includes South Korea and Japan, is the main game, or in his metaphor, the core of the walnut. The shell of the walnut is the East Asia summit, which includes India and two Western countries, Australia and New Zealand. In Sue's influential article, the shell's purpose is to protect the core from damage. In this case, intervention from the US." End of quote. So China's walnut is uh, constructed through trade agreements, is to position itself within the region as, as a regional leader and to protect from the US. Now the US, of course, has not simply been uh, sat on the sidelines watching this unfold. Uh, without its own interests. So it has launched the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, negotiations. So this arose, uh, originally there were four, uh, well, the so-called P4 countries were Sin Singapore, Brunei, New Zealand, and, and Chile, who were negotiated uh, started negotiating their own free trade agreement amongst the four of them as, as part of the APEC process. Now, the US became involved in 2008. The US has free trade agreements with three of those countries already, and collectively they account for a very small amount of US trade. So it's not a big deal economically. It's, this is not something that's being driven by US corporate interests. This is being driven by US political interests in this case. Uh, so uh, the U.S. joined with the P4 to announce the, the TPP, which it describes as a 21st century next generation agreement with high standards. And the objective is to link the U.S. economy uh, back in with the fastest growing uh, part of the world economy, Asia. So there's a, a clear economic motive in doing that, but excluding China. So the negotiations which it is uh, talking about means that uh, no sectors will be excluded from 
the agreement. It will include labor and environmental standards. Uh, it is, in view of this morning's discussion on, on value chains, one of the things that it's designed to do, and I quote from the US documents, is to facilitate the development and production uh, and supply chains amongst TPP members. So it's tended to reposition US firms uh, in Asia. It also has cross-cutting themes, uh, in including development. And I thought I would just share with you the text, or the, uh, well, it's under negotiation, but the, the view of development as, uh, as put forward in the TP TPP. So I quote again, uh, comprehensive and robust market liberalization Improvements in trade and investment enhancing disciplines and other commitments, including a mechanism to help all TPP countries to effectively implement the agreement and fully realize its benefits, will serve to strengthen institutions important for economic development and governance, and thereby contribute significantly to advancing TPP's respective economic development priorities. In other words, liberalization, disciplines, uh, sign on to everything, and that will get you the right institutions, which are the key now to development. Okay, so uh, people have argued that what the US is doing in, in this strategy is adopting what's called a tipping point strategy. By the US joining with the, these four countries, then that would encourage others to join in too. And that is exactly what's happened, and membership is now up, up to 12 right, countries. So what has been the, the response to this? Well, ASEAN has been placed in a, a difficult position. Uh, TPP includes four of its members, but, it, but doesn't include the other six. So it has tried to regain the initiative uh, by promoting this uh, ASEAN plus six arrangement, which would be Asia-based but dilute the influence of China by the inclusion of India, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, it's more based on uh, ASEAN-type principles, whereby uh, countries at different levels of development uh, are able to move at different speeds. Uh, it's all consensus-based, uh, so it gives more flexibility and, and more policy space. So it's an attempt to regain coherence and regain uh, control of, of the agenda uh, following the TPP. Uh, in China, uh, China viewed the TPP as an attempt to contain China's rise as part of a wider part of uh, US, US declared Asia's, an Asian pivot, which uh, included the um, putting more of the U.S.'s military assets in Asia uh, and away from, away from the Gulf. So they, they viewed it very much as a, a part of a, a containment strategy uh, of, uh, on China. And that is shared by people not only uh, in China but also outside of it. I was talking to a, a senior trade negotiator for Canada uh, recently and asked him what he thought about the, the TPP. And uh, he said... Um, and I quote, I've always thought of the TPP as the trade equivalent to the Seventh Fleet containing China. Now that's quite, that's quite a strong, you don't expect Canadian trade negotiators to say things like that, but, but that was his view. So it's sort of widely, thank you, it's sort of widely shared that, that that's, the, that's part of the intention here. In a, an editorial in, in the People's Daily in January of 2013, uh, it was argued China's position seemed to be that it's an effort to contain China, but it's not going to work. That the TPP is stagnating, was the word that was used in, in the editorial, um, because it was transparent that it was just a way of trying to push U.S. interests and was not uh, respecting the development agendas of of other countries in the region. So it seemed fairly confident that whilst it was an attempt to contain China, it would not be successful in doing so. However, all that changed in uh, May 2013 when Japan decided that it would join the TTP negotiations. 
It had previously been, or continually discussing with China and South Korea, a three-way uh, trade agreement, and then it's, it's gone and uh, joined the TPP now. And, it, and that caused quite a large reaction in China, where much of the, the press was talking about how now China is engaged in a containment strategy with the US uh, of China. Uh, so it's, a, uh, again, this geopolitical explanation. And uh, the Ministry of Commerce announced that it would uh, now study the TPP proposal and may consider joining it itself. So China's position seems to be shifting as a result of Japan joining, that it now sees uh, more fear in, in that containment strategy. Um, now, there are interests within China pushing for that. So I've talked about China and as if it was a unitary state. Actually, of course, it isn't. Um, but for the purposes of time, I've had to say that. But within, within China, there are clear domestic constituencies who, which would like China to join the TPP for the same reason that they wanted China to join the WTO. That's to say that they, they, viewed the, uh, they viewed trade deals as a way of pushing domestic reform of opening up new sectors in the Chinese economy to external competition. Um, so because the TPP is... China's not. Uh, right, okay, thank you very much. Uh, and carrying on, uh, as... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there are domestic constituencies, so-called pro-reform constituencies, which, will, which are pushing the idea of joining TPP. Uh, so, d just to conclude then. These free trade agreements in the, in the region are not just about trying to find the best way uh, to trade widgets. Uh, they are a response to China's rise, including by China itself, in a context of nervous neighbours and threatened hegemons. Uh, within each state, they, they are non-unitary state, there are forces pushing them in each way. And what we're seeing in the region is unfolding chain reactions, and uh, we would expect more to come. Thank you. Thank you.